Good afternoon. Welcome to our CCIQ webinar presentation this afternoon, data storage, security and business continuity webinar presentation. Um, today, um, I am delighted to welcome Scott Raphael from GPK Group, who is our presenter for today. Before I hand over to Scott, um, my name's Karen Fitzgibbons. I'm the General Manager of Corporate Alliances here at CCIQ, and I'm delighted to be facilitating the webinar today. Um, just in relation to questions, um, all of our attendees today have an opportunity to write a question. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please write that in the box. And then what I will be doing is I'll be um, compiling all of those. And then once Scott has finished his presentation, we will take the time, we'll go through and those answer for those directly. Um, without any further ado, I will hand over to Scott. Thanks very, Thanks very much, Karen. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank CCIQ for welcoming GPK to present this presentation on data storage security and business continuity today. Whilst it's a broad subject, I will try to narrow it down and hit on some hot topics and technologies to help empower your business going forward. Some of the pitfalls and, and tribulations that go along with that. Uh, from our experience. So just a bit of background about myself. Um, I've been in ICT for 20 plus years, uh, living and working all around the world, uh, working for some large multinational organisations such as Johnson Johnson, Anglo-American Coal, Louis Vuitton, Tag Heuer, those sorts of businesses. Um, I've lived in Indonesia, Malaysia um, and in Chile as well. So I'm with GPK as a Queensland State Manager. Uh, I still have a very uh, heavy technical background. I'm a point of escalation for our business up here in Queensland. And we have a team of eight people in the Brisbane location. So today's webinar, Data Storage Security and Business Continuity. Um, today's webinar will run for approximately 30 to 40 minutes. The topics are today, the changing landscape of IT. There's a lot going on. How does it affect me? Storage options, traditional storage, or hosting uh, versus cloud versus hybrid. Data security, remote access, offsite data, two-factor slash multi-factor authentication, and encryption, encryption device and file encryption. Uh, business continuity, uh, strategies, policies, compliance, um, and the technology that we use to deliver. Uh, and then finally, uh, open floor, like Karen said before, any questions that you might have about this. So let's get into it. So the landscape of IT has changed. What's out there? The industry currently, as today, has gone through a massive change. Um, the traditional landscape of IT, when you structure your IT, was each service that you were providing required a server. So when we were starting out, you would buy a, a server for file print, you would buy a server for email, you would buy a server for the Active Directory, which controls your user base logons, uh, what they can get access to. And that all came at an associated cost, quite a large cost. Nowadays, with um, virtualization taking place, uh, what virtualization is, it allows us to have one piece of hardware, say one server, and it allows us then to have um, multiple guests running on top of that, so one to many. What that does is brings uh, the cost down first and foremost, but it also improves efficiency. So where we're not needing to spend that extra money on additional servers or, or lots of servers, we can then start looking at redundancy and how we can protect um, our businesses from IT outages. Um, and that also encroaches on business uh, continuity as well. On top of that, uh, we have things like unified communication nowadays, which includes voice, video, chat, and shared collaboration. Now, shared collaboration, um, that entails, you know, like today, what we're doing, a, a, a webinar, a meeting. Um, we could be doing that wherever. We, we're no longer confined to our local office. We could be anywhere in the world and, and conduct meetings using voice, video, chat, and again, the shared collaboration. Um, the next item, your trusted IT partner. First and foremost, this is pinnacle to any successful business. Um, we need 
in an ever fast moving society, we need to concentrate in our core business and align ourselves with partner that can help empower our business. More so understanding and having an in-depth knowledge of your business, where it's come from, where it's going to, the culture, the types of technology that you've, you've, you've previously used and the direction for new technology uh, as we move forward. So typically, uh, we need to structure our ITC support. So uh, previously, that was a break-fix method. It was very reactive. A problem would happen, you'd pick up the phone or you'd send an email and then notify your IT support company that there was an issue. They would schedule a technician or someone to come out on site and, and fix that issue for you. Uh, nowadays, we have what we call proactive maintenance agreements where, it, like the term says, it's very much proactive. You enter into a, a maintenance agreement with an IT company and they provide support. Um, they'll provide um, leadership as far as your technology, give you some consultancy and direction on where you should be uh, investing uh, your IT budget. So storage options, where do I store my data? Do I stay with traditional model of storing data on premise? Do we look at moving to the cloud? Uh, partners like Microsoft, they have an Azure platform today. Amazon have AWS, Amazon Web Services. There's a whole host of different companies out there that are, that are now providing um, cloud services for you. There's another section to this is you can build your own cloud. What is it? You're, uh, building your own cloud basically would be uh, taking space, renting space in a data center, using your own equipment and putting your products and services uh, in a secure data center. There's a cost obviously that's associated with that. More often than not, what we see in the marketplace currently with SMB style businesses is that you will lease, you'll go to a provider such as um, Azure or AWS, They'll give you a subscription base where you will, um, it's, it's a menu, it's basically tick the box for what you need. You might need a mail server, you may need an Active Directory server, you may need some SharePoint, uh, which is again group collaboration where you can store your documents, files, document control, that sort of thing. Um, that will bring the cost of, of IT down because no longer now do you need to go out and, and, and fund thousands of dollars worth of, of hardware and software licenses. You basically, like I said before, you have a menu, you tick the boxes of what you require. You may need an email server with you know, 10, 20 mail accounts, what have you. Um, but again, it's all come back to a subscription-based uh, service. So the hybrid solution, a uh, hybrid solution, pardon me, is a combination of on-premise infrastructure, so you might decide to keep your file print servers at your, at your office, at your business, and you may decide to take up some cloud services. Like I said before, it might be email, some web services, it might be an e-commerce solution. Um, but it's not just limited, to the, the cloud hosting is not just limited to IT equipment. Nowadays, we've seen a, a big shift with everything going to the cloud. Um, the business that I work for, we're not just an IT company. We do have a, a retail arm um, where we have POS systems. Well, those POS systems now, the servers that run those POS systems can now sit up in the cloud. Uh, PABX is your phone systems. That's a hot topic nowadays. Um, communication is, is, is paramount. Successful communication, efficient communication is paramount to any successful business. Um, at, and along with that, the communication, again, is both voice, video, and shared collaboration. These items are, are all moving to the cloud nowadays. So it means that if you have multiple sites, uh, if your business has uh, multiple locations, no longer do you need to have a phone system at each location. You can have one phone system up in the cloud, the cloud, just a buzzword, in the data center, a secure location, uh, where it will serve your workforce. Again, bringing the, the total cost of IT down, um, so you can uh, you, you have that budget to work with. It's a monthly budget. Again, it's you, you don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars up front. Um, there were tens of thousands of dollars are up front. 
um, to get this off the ground. Um, are you ready to even move to the cloud? Uh, uh, some some investigation needs to be done on on your network, uh, on your infrastructure, um, to see whether you're you're ready to move that to the cloud. Um, some of the considerations around that, uh, again, um, when you're moving to the cloud, you're removing the infrastructure from your local office and you're putting it into a data center. So now you've got to take into consideration things like your internet links, the, the internet pipe, your connection coming into the business. Traditionally, most businesses have had an ADSL connection. Um, and ADSL has served us well, but with technology moving forward, um, and, and more pressure being put on these links because, again, we're taking our data from an on-premise scenario and we're pushing it into the cloud. So that puts extra pressure on our internet links. So before we go and commit to, to moving to the cloud and signing our life away, if you like, we need to make sure that some of those bases are covered. Is my internet link going to support my user base and the products and services that I'm offering out of the cloud. Um, some of the technologies, you heard me say ADSL before, some of the technologies that we look at when we're talking about internet links, are EOC, Ethernet over copper, high speed. Um, traditionally, you know, ADSL, you know, 24 meg down, one meg up, it's, it's asymmetrical, which means it will only talk one way at a time. Um, these more performance styled links, uh, more business related, they're symmetrical. So they're the same speed down as they are up and, and they'll talk uh, bi-directional at the same time. So there's EOC, then there's fibre. Now I know everybody's heard the buzzword about the MBN. Um, the MBN's only been a fairly recent thing for us. However, fibre's been around for a long time. Fibre traditionally has been very expensive, but with thanks to the MBN, those fibre prices now have come down and come down quite considerably. So these things that I'm talking to you about today aren't meant to scare you away from the cloud or anything like that. They're meant to provoke thought. Hopefully today after this webinar, it'll invoke some, some thoughts and discussions uh, for yourself and, and maybe GPK can be included in that. Uh, so data security, one of the, the, the big things around um, our, the trusting another company with our data is security. Who's got access to it? The different security methods. Uh, my data's in the cloud now, how safe is it? How do data breaches happen and how can I protect my data? Well, I just want to back up a little bit and just go through a couple of the different security methods around um, because a lot of people tend to, to get confused when we talk about the security methods and how we structure our data to make sure you know, it's not prone to attack or, or you know, outside uh, attacks aren't uh, seeping our data out. So different security methods for our local base, the people on our network, we look at things like file and folder security. Who's in what group? Do those groups have the correct um, um, permissions assigned? And um, while I'm at this, these things should be audited on a regular basis. Too many times over the last 20 years in the industry have I seen simple things being missed. Um, routine checks, again, auditing your systems on a regular basis, understanding where your network has come from and where it's going and everything in between is paramount to keeping your data safe. So we have a look at um, what we call NTFS permissions, file and, and, and folder permissions. On top of that, we have um, the group permissions that I spoke about before, but also it could be um, multi-factor authentication. We log into our computer systems or we log into a website with a username and password that's quite, up, uh, quite often being given to us. We might change the password, well hopefully we would change the password to something more secure and no password or password one or let me in is not a secure password. Secure passwords today should be a combination of alphanumeric um, containing characters. Um, the best sort of password that you could use would be a, a phrase um, and mix that up, replace vowels with numbers. So like I's with ones, 
um, S's with fives, those style of things. Um, the longer the pass phrase is, the longer the phrase that you use, the harder that then uh, for the hackers to, to be able to, to break that. Um, some, uh, while I'm at it, some of the things that um, we should be concerned about as well when we're looking at our data security are the different types of attacks that can take place. Um, we're on a t with, with the world being 24-7 now, 365 days a year and our data being accessible all that time, um, attacks are becoming more and more prevalent. How do we keep ourselves safe from that? So again, passwords is a big thing. Enabling multi-factor or two-factor authentication, that also helps to, to, to keep your data and your user base safe from any outside influence. So two-factor authentication, I'll just touch on that for a moment. So again, we have a username and password, whether that's logging into our PC first up in the morning or whether that's logging onto a, a, a website, it might be your e-commerce site if, if you're an e-business, that style of thing. Traditionally, again, we use a username and password to log in. That's one step. The next step then would be a code, like an RSA code. Um, for those people that remember, I think Suncorp Bank was one of the guys that, one of the businesses that, that used to use this or still do to this day. They give you a little key ring and on there there's a, it's a little digital device with um, a random set of numbers that gets generated every 60 seconds and that's timed back to an RSA server back at the bank to keep those codes safe. Um, so you'll log in with your username and password, it'll prop up and it'll say enter your code, so you enter your code and again those codes change. Now there's plenty of, uh, of companies around offering two-factor authentication, again Microsoft's one, of course Google's another. Um, these are things that you know, I would encourage you to enable, um, even on your, if you're using Gmail, just a Google email account, you can enable two-step authentication on that. Um, you can go um, to the extreme, which is having USB devices, where your USB device is your key, so you plug that into the computer, it recognises who you are because it's your device, you log in with your username and password. Without that device, even if you tried to log in with your username and password, it would not allow you to go through because it does not contain um, the two-factor authentication mechanism. So there are two parts to this. There could be a hardware device that acts as your, a part of your authentication process, or it may be it's a code that gets sent, like Google Authenticator has an application that you use that will generate a code, and when you log in, it'll prompt you to enter that code. If you enter that code successfully, guess what? You get access. If you don't, you don't get access. It's pretty straightforward. Um, Another, another area uh, that's a, a hot topic currently is unified threat management. What is unified threat management? Unified threat management is a suite of products as your frontline defence to your business. So um, a, a manufacturer, a, a good vendor of this would be Sophos. Sophos have a UTM appliance, it's called an appliance uh, because we can either have it in a physical state where it's a, a physical device or we can have it as a virtualised device. It's completely up to us. So basically what that does, there's several different elements to this. First and foremost, it stops any nasties getting through. So a router, just a modem router, does not give you any type of protection at all. It's there to form a connection to the internet for you. Um, it's there to offer some port forward, so if you need some particular protocols coming in, i.e. you need to get remote access, that works on a protocol. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the protocol lingo and, and all the, the, the different ports and that style of thing. Um, again, it's just to demonstrate some of the products and services that you should be having a look at out there um, to help keep your business safe. Uh, again, with the so Sophos product, um, it has a gateway filter, so it will scan all the nasties coming in and out of the network, whether you're doing web surfing, that sort of um, It does have a web surfing um, component, like um, so it will keep you um, safe from, you know, if it was uh, pornography or if there was coarse language, it could scan that and block that. It also has lists available um, for your website filtering too, so if you, were, if you had an employee that was trying to look at, um, I don't know, manufacturing a bomb or, you know, pornography or um, 
you know, that style of thing, you can have lists where you can, you know, block certain websites or you can have it automatically blocked based on a reputation rating that comes back from Sophos. Um, they're very good, they keep them very well updated. Uh, again, this is just another um, tool, another piece of equipment that you can keep, that you can use um, to help keep your user base safe. Uh, Sophos also offers uh, mail integration, so it will do all your anti-spam and anti-virus scanning. Um, and I'm going to touch on this because the next point I've got on my slide is virus and malware, uh, which is a big topic at the moment. I'll explain why shortly. So Sophos is a, a unified piece of equipment. So not only does it do your website filtering, a gateway scanning, so scanning at packet level um, to see whether any viruses are coming down from websites or coming across your internet link. It will also do your, your uh, anti-spam and anti-malware. Um, but it also can control the business as far as um, incoming access and outgoing access and, and those styles of things. So the virus and malware protection. Um, over the last 12 to 18 months, I'm sure most people have heard of CryptoLocker. Now CryptoLocker is a, a nasty little piece of uh, software um, that's caused a lot of headaches around the world. Uh, basically, it, it's, a, it's a piece of software that's been written that encrypts the contents at file level uh, of your hard drive. So if you had all these documents and you got infected with a, a crypto locker, it would basically go through and encrypt all your files. It would pop up a, a screen saying that you need to pay this ransom, you need to contact these people. Typically nowadays it's in Bitcoin, Bitcoin being an ele electronic currency. Uh, it's typically used you know, in the deep web, the underworld. You know, There are some legitimate uses for it. Uh, but typically you would need to pay, once you'd been infected by the crypto locker uh, virus, you would need to uh, pay to get the key. And the unfortunate part there is, there's no guarantee that the hackers will even give you the, the decryption key that you need to you know, restore your data. So with the event of, of these types of viruses coming out, and there's a new, just uh, a tidbit of information for you, there has been a new version of this uh, crypto locker virus come out where it's not doing file and, and folder encryption anymore. It's encrypting the hard drive, uh, which is next level stuff. It means that, you know, uh, it means that no longer do they have to worry about encrypting thousands of files on every drive. They can encrypt at drive level. It's much quicker, much faster, and, and, and unfortunately, is a lot more destructive. Um, they're, there's ways that we've been able to cultivate getting around or getting some of that data back if you've been uh, an unfortunate soul that's been hit by the, the crypto locker. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to drive level encryption, uh, it really doesn't leave many places to go. And that's why it's paramount that you take the required steps that you have, you know, antivirus and, and malware protection, and it's kept up to date. Um, the new way that we're we're looking at antivirus. Uh, it's no longer done by definition, so you have to, when you download the antivirus product and it updates, quite often it would go out to an update server and pull down these virus definitions. Those virus definitions are only as good as the antivirus company that's writing them, and they're only good at that point in time that they write them, because the time between when they they write the virus definition files. There could be a new variant of the virus that comes out that's not covered by those definition files. And guess what? You're no longer protected. So virus company, antivirus companies now have shifted away from the traditional definition files to a fingerprint. So they actually, it's cloud. Again, there's that buzzword, cloud. It, it's designed to scan real time using a set of digital fingerprints that's held back at that particular antivirus company. I know one of the products that we uh, sell and support that works really well is a product called WebRoot, um, just to, to name drop to give you a, a, an area to, get, to investigate. But again, um, I, I don't want to play this down, but I, at the same time, I don't want to overcook it. It's most important if you've, if you've got a feeling that you might be vulnerable, it's better to spend a couple of bucks now, pick up the phone, ring your IT company, get them to do an audit, get them to you know, come in and just run their eyes over the systems uh, and make sure that you're safe from, from these nasties. 
um, like I said, it's better spend a little bit of money now than, than find out you're going to be in a world of hurt later on. Um, which brings us into business continu uh, conti continuity, my apologies. Um, some strategies, refresh cycles, hardware, software, your backup strategies and also support. So we look at ref refresh cycles. Refresh cycles we have for server, desktops and other devices. So there's two cycles that we really look at. Server refresh cycles should be ideally carried out every three to four years. Um, most vendors, HP, Dell, IBM, Lenovo, those sorts of guys, um, they will give you a, whether it's a three year next day on site warranty or three year same day on site warranty, uh, it's generally a three year warranty that's offered by default. They will extend that once you come out of the warranty. Uh, I know HP call it uh, after service care. Um, it's where you come out of warranty. They'll They'll typically, you can buy extension packs uh, for typically one or two years. Now that's a worst case scenario. Unlike desktops and laptops that get turned off on a regular basis, your servers don't. Your servers are typically running 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those guys go through a lot of pressure. There's a lot of stress put them on, on them from time to time. And, and let's face it, they're on 24 hours a day. So, it is important to keep those guys up to date and current um, and the refresh cycle, like I said, typically that three to four year bracket, four maximum on your servers. Um, your desktops, laptops and devices, you typically can get away with a little bit longer on those. You know, let's face it, if, uh, if a desktop computer or a laptop computer dies at the end of the day, Yes, it's an inconvenience. Is it going to is it going to hamper the business as a whole? No, it it'll make one person's life difficult, perhaps for for a day or two, um, but it's not going to have a significant impact on a business such as if a, a, a server failed. Um, and that's why when we look at um, uh, protecting businesses and 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 making sure your business is going to stay online, we look at you know adding redundancy. And you heard me talk about before, you know, the, the evolution of technology going from traditional computing now into virtualization where we can run many servers on one physical device. It allows us then to maybe the budget's there to put a second server in for redundancy, maybe some load balancing. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the point of that exercise is to keep your business afloat. So the, you know, server A would replicate to server B, and if server A went down, server B would, would pick up the slack and continue on and allow your business to function with you know, the, the minimalist uh, amount of downtime possible. So some of the strategies that you should be looking at, your backup strategy, how does your backup strategy work? Um, a, a lot of the time, you know, uh, going back again over the, the 20 odd years I've been in the industry, Backups are the, the bane of my existence. Um, it's, it's the make or break of a business. You know, unfortunately, uh, most businesses are going to go through an, uh, some sort of downtime or some, some sort of, of, of pain in IT. Um, and your backups, are your, that's what's, it's your saving grace. When, when everything else has fallen apart and your servers have failed or, or, or worst case scenario, it's all down, you can't recover from that server, you've got, to, you've got to rely on your backup. What state are your backups in? And I could give you numerous examples of where I've gone out to visit, you know, clients that have been referred to me that you know, are going through some pain or they need to, someone to come in and, and sort some issues out for them. And the first thing I ask them is, tell me about your backup strategy. If I went and grabbed your backups, would I get a 100% success rate on restoring your data? And the amount of times where I see the blood drain out of people's face, they go white um, because they don't think about it. They just, they get on, uh, they do their business, they just assume you know their backups are happening as they should. Um, you know, more often than not, we see problems with backups and, and, and not being able to get, you know, all the data back successfully. And there's simple things that you can do to, to make sure that those backups are happening on a regular basis. First and foremost, 
um, we should be looking at notifications, email notifications. Um, you may not need to, to know about the success, but you definitely want to know whether your backups have been missed, whether there, whether there was a backup failure for whatever reason. Um, the software that you'd be using like Backup Exec to give you a, a name of a product, um, ArcServe, um, UDP, these are all backup solutions. They all carry um, notification panels in there. They also deal with things like retention. Um, retention is how many backups can I hold? You know, uh, because we're we're backing up data every day, every night. Um, typically, we run incremental, differential, and full backups, and they're they're different styles, but they all complement each other. They all serve a purpose. So what happens is uh, we've got some compliancing that we need to look at, which is both from a financial point of view and a legal point of view. Financial, you know, you know your financial records, that sort of stuff. I know that's seven years, so you've got to keep that data now. It's no longer printed and put into a filing cabinet what had been previously done for many years. We're now holding this information electronically. A, we've got to make sure that that, that data is viable, i.e. if we ever get audited or we need to go back to it, we need to be able to get our hands on it and make sure that it's intact, that we've got all that data intact. So that provokes the thought of how much storage am I going to need for my backups. So there's a process that we need to go through um, to make sure that, again, in the event that your business does suffer um, from a from an IT failure, that we've got a good backup set that we can use. Um, it's not expensive to do. It takes a little bit of planning, but at the end of the day, planning is what's going going to guarantee you to be successful um, and also keeping your systems um, up and running. Again, it's one of the reasons nowadays why uh, preventative maintenance contracts with your trusted IT partner are more important than ever. Um, you've heard me talk about these different technologies, you know, the, the changing landscape of IT where we've come from physical servers now into virtualization, and then to complement that, we've also got some new services you know, your phone systems are being virtualized now, it's all computer controlled. You've got web services, you know, that style of thing. It, it, it's a lot for a business owner or a business executive to take on yourself. You need to align yourself, again, with a trusted IT partner that can come in, that can help you plan for the future, show you what technology is out in the marketplace and what's going to benefit your business, empower your business, make your business um, your workforce more mobile and more efficient. Um, the other things I'd like to touch on quickly um, are policies. A lot of businesses, especially in the SMB sector, um, we don't see a lot of policies being written or available for the user base around, you know, accessing. It might be just the simple fact of um, a process. Or, sorry, a policy. Um, that pops up on the screen when you log in saying that this is a property of unauthorised access, you know, that style of thing. Um, to remote access where your staff might be ac accessing your equipment remotely, say from home or from overseas, from another location. Then on top of that, we've got uh, bring your own devices nowadays, BYOD. That's where companies are allowing people to bring in their own private devices, whether that be a mobile device, whether that be a laptop, um, and join it to the, the corporate network. Um, there's no issue with that. You can have a, a local profile, like your personal profile to your work profile, and, and neither of them will encroach on the territory. Um, we've got a social aspect now with the thanks to Facebook, Twitter, that also has an impact on how we do business, more so how we communicate. Um, I've seen a lot of successful businesses advertising nowadays um, and being successful on Facebook. Um, but not only that, how do our employees interact uh, on social media? Uh, because that has a, a, a direct um, um, involvement of your business reputation. Then we've got all this data. Uh, how do we store it? How do we make it accessible to our user base? 
Um, again, we've got a Microsoft product and there's lots of different products out there that will do the same thing, but probably the most common product out there in the marketplace would be SharePoint. SharePoint, an online collaboration system. Um, you can build applications, there's templates, uh, document repositories, i.e., um, I'm a new technician to GPK. How do I do my job? I can jump onto the internet, I can open up SharePoint, I can search for my job description, say I was a systems engineer or a systems technician. I search that, it brings me up a document that tells me how to do my job. If I needed to put a support request in, say my phone wasn't working, you could find that information on the internet. The internet, I'll relate to SharePoint, but it really does encompass a whole lot more. SharePoint's just one part of that. A very, very powerful uh, part of that, I should say, um, but SharePoint, definitely something the SMB market should be looking at. Um, again, these are, these are products that, you know, they don't take a lot of effort to implement, but they can certainly solve uh, a, a lot of issues with accessing data and structuring, you know, your data and your IT network. So again, looking at compliance, so I spoke about before about the legal and the financial obligations that we've got to retain that data over you know, a period of time. Again, I mentioned before, seven years with the ATO. The archiving and retention of that, how do we store that data? Do we store, you know, the last thing I'd ever suggest someone to do would be to store it on a single drive, like let's say a USB drive. I'd be storing that on a, a storage server, whether that be in the partnered up with Amazon or GPK or AWS, it, it doesn't matter, but storing that uh, on a purpose-built storage platform. Holding your financial documents on a single drive is a recipe for disaster. Um, you would want that seeing on a, a, on a device, on a platform that has some redundancy, um, that you'll be able to get to that data um, without any issue, without, you know, worrying whether that drive's going to work or not in, in years to come. So the technology is available for, for business continuity. I, these are pretty large topics, I've got to say, too, and, and I hope I'm, I'm, I'm doing it a little bit of justice for you guys and provoking some thought and some ideas um, for you and your business. But the technology is available uh, today to allow us to, to have business continue. So you heard me talk about before where we've got um, virtualization, where that allows us to have many servers running on one physical platform. Well, again, we could put in another host, another physical server, and have that replicate the guests to provide redundancy. Or we might have a look at a hybrid solution where you've decided that, hey, maybe, I'm not going to go to a full cloud solution right now. We might break this off in stages, and that's very achievable. Again, you know, we might decide to keep our AD server, the main AD server, um, security server, if you like, logon server, on the local site. But we might decide to take out a subscription with um, Microsoft and have an AD server up in the cloud and have that replicate so that if your on-site server goes down, your user base can still log on and work. Now you could take that a step further and say, okay, well I'm going to have my application servers on-site, but I may decide to have some applications up in the cloud. These applications might be ERP system, might be your financial system, they might be your CRM, um, they, they're your core business applications is, is what I'm trying to get at. Email is a good example. Um, Nowadays, I, I wouldn't recommend um, a company to run their own mail servers. Um, the problem with running a mail server is that if it's only one mail server and you get hit by a virus or you suffer from a, um, a catastrophic failure, be it a hardware failure, your mail goes down. Nobody can contact you electronically now. Um, when we talk about hosting providers um, and the cloud, typically, this infrastructure um, is all redundant. So not only do we have server to server redundancy, but you heard me talk about before data centers. Data centers are a purpose built building, very secure. Um, I have very close ties to Next DC um, here in, in Brisbane. They're all over Australia. They're actually just about to build a new data center here in Brisbane. But again, these are purpose 
uh, built um, buildings that house all of our servers. So server rack after server rack, being able to provide turnkey solutions, whether that's data center as a service. Um, you probably saw before I've, I've, I've got those terminologies in there that we all love to hate. IaaS, SaaS, PaaS, DAS. Um, IaaS is infrastructure as a service, so that might be where you rent your servers um, from a data center rather than, or, or from a hosting provider, rather than buying the physical servers yourself. Uh, SaaS, software as a service. So we look at um, so sub sub subscription, sorry, subscription-based modeling, where we no longer buy, a, let's say, a, a copy of an operating system. Say Windows 10 now is a new flagship operating system, desktop operating system for Microsoft. So we no longer buy the physical license. We might have Office as well, Microsoft Office. We no longer buy that physical license for Office anymore. We rent the license. Uh, basically, essentially. Um, that allows for us to be able to put a budget together. Um, ra again, rather than having to spend tens of thousands of dollars, whether you're starting out or whether you're going through a, whether you're an existing business going through a network refresh, this all helps to reduce our cost. Um, it, it's also good because there's no wastage either. Traditionally, you know, let's say we went out through a hardware refresh and we had 70 employees. Well, business slowed down a little bit. We had to let some people go. Now we've only got 50 employees, but we've got 70 licenses still. So typically, it was a there's a waste there. With the subscription-based models, it allows us to it allows us to rise and fall as we need to. We can scale up and scale back as as required. So we might be a let's take an example a building company. Uh, we've got a big project on. Uh, the Queensland Government have come to ask us to build a, a nice new building for them, so we're going to bring all these contractors on. Now, they're contractors, they're not full-time employees, but we need to be able to give them access into our business products and services and applications to be able to do their job effectively. So rather than need to go out and buy individual licence and pay up front, we do a subscription-based modelling where it's per month. So when the contract comes to a finish and we no longer have those 70 employees um, doing that contract, we might go back down to shrink down to 20 employees. Then we're only paying for 20 licences because we can shrink that, we can rise and fall the amount of licence re we require month to month, basically. Um, so it's keeping your hard-earned dollar in your pocket where you can invest that in to empower your other IT systems. It might be, um, again, moving to the cloud or it might be you know, expanding and putting private links in between your business um, to better um, uh, increase efficiency so you're not needing to overcomplicate with you know, lots of different hardware and, and things like that. The other technologies that allow business continuity, you know, one of the big things in IT is we talk about redundancy. Redundancy could be anything from, oh, I've got an internet link. Okay, well, what happens when that goes down? Well, we lose internet. So if your business is an online business that needs to stay connected, that, that, that is looking to go into the cloud, maybe you need to have a redundant internet link. So a failover, so if one goes down, the other will, one will pick up and, and, and keep the business going. Um, that could also come back down to like poor servers you know, put two servers in, have it replicate, that will help keep your, your business up and running. Um, risk assessments are, are, are a favourite of mine, you know, looking at the business and finding out where your risks are from an IT point of view. Now, this isn't a cash cow what I'm talking about. This isn't just a way for, you know, the IT guys to make money or anything like that. It, it, it's really designed um, to... to keep things running for you and show you where your pitfalls are, if there's any vulnerabilities that are found or if there's any gaps in your processes or procedures, we can close those up to minimise your risk. Um, again, I, I, I can't stress it enough, um, if you haven't got a trusted IT partner, get out there and, and, and find someone, talk to someone about you know, what IT requirements, what pain that you've, you've come from, if there's any, what pain have you faced, what challenges are you looking for, are, are looking at moving forward, um, because this is a, a fast-paced industry. I, I know people bang on about this time and time again about IT being 
you know, so ever changing and, and it is fast paced. And look, again, a 20 year veteran, it's never been as fast as it is now. We've got so many changes on so many different fronts. The way we interact business to business, again, you know, the hardware landscape has changed uh, from a physical platform to a virtualization platform. How we purchase and how we procure our software from a licensing model, you know, um, buying it outright to a subscription base. Uh, again, for budget, um, all these sorts of things, you know, uh, need to be taken into consideration, um, and 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 certainly that conversation needs to be had uh, with your IT partner because they're the people that are going to stand beside you and help deliver those products and services to your workforce. Um, I guess I'd like to open that up to the floor now, and uh, is there any questions anyone would like to ask? Oh, thanks, Karen. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding antivirus and malware programs by utilising Microsoft, including Windows 10? Uh, Kim, thanks for the question, Kim. Well, Kim, look, Microsoft has taken a pretty hard stance um, as far as antivirus and malware is concerned. Um, now, I'm a guy that I can I, I can swing between Mac, your Mac OS, um, Linux or Unix and Windows. Um, so there's a whole bunch of, of different platforms um, that I've got experience with. Um, and the one thing that I've seen in all my years, Windows tends to get hit with viruses uh, a lot more than say Linux or, or Macs. Uh, Microsoft have taken a pretty hard stance on that and since Windows 7, they, uh, they included a product called Windows Defender. That's carried through uh, into Windows 8, 8.1, and of course Windows 10 today. Built-in antivirus applications such as Defender, look, they're better than nothing. They do do a job, um, but if you ask me, you need to buy an off-the-shelf application. Um, you know, Defender will look at you know your antivirus and, and your malware, but there's other things as well. You know, there's root kits and and there's other vulnerabilities that can be detected um, on your PC as well. So um, some of those guys are uh, Norton or Symantec, McAfee, uh, Trend. Um, of course, the company that I work for, we sell and support WebRoot, again, because it aligns with our model. The model being that the definition files that you traditionally have to download, like I said before, um, they're only as good as at the time they're written. Whereas when we go to a fingerprint or a digital fingerprint, cloud-based solution, that's real time. Um, so your chances of, of protection or catching a nasty uh, is a lot higher with a cloud-based system than it would be with your traditional downloading your virus definitions. Uh, I hope I've, uh, I've answered that adequately for you, Kim. Uh, next question, I use Dropbox as my backup for all my data. Is this a good move? That's from Kerry. Great question, Kerry. Um, look, if I look at just storing, you know, you're storing your data. Say you've got some family pictures. Let's just keep it simple on your local computer. As opposed to having it on your local computer and then synchronising with a Dropbox server. Synchronisation with a Dropbox server is always going to be better than just having that data located on one device because the reality is if that device gets broken, lost, stolen, damaged, you can pretty well kiss your data goodbye. Um, there are, you know, data recovery, and I am a specialist in data recovery of uh, data forensics. Um, it's not always 100% guaranteed that you'll get your data back. Again, but getting back to your your question about Dropbox, yes, Dropbox is is good to use to keep another version of your files. You've got to remember though that when you're looking at online portals or online services like this. You're only going to be protected as good as your password. Uh, unfortunately, you know we're creatures of habit. Um, most people I've met out there use basically the same password for everything. 
there might be a few variances uh, with the with the you know say let me in which I, I never recommend to use that as a password but they might use some variances but I'd always uh, suggest in using a separate password for each application I know that gets a, a, a bit um, frustrating because you've got all these usernames and passwords but there's two tools and utilities around um, that we can utilize like password managers and, and, and that sort of stuff that we can use to hold those passwords safe and, and obviously have that data encrypted so that nobody else can get access to your passwords. Um, you've got online storage facilities so you, know, you said Dropbox um, there's online facilities where you can do your off-site backup. I'd always recommend though, Kerry, um, it's great that you've got a copy on your computer and there's a copy at Dropbox, but if Dropbox servers ever get compromised, and look, their security model is pretty good, but we've seen you know, an influx of, of, um, of attacks recently, um, and they're only going to get stronger. Um, whereby they're targeting, you know, these large corporations, you know, to disrupt business and, and cause pain and the rest of it. So I'd always recommend that you, you know, at least have a copy on USB or uh, have a copy somewhere else um, at the end of the day, you know, it, it'll just help keep you safe. Uh, could you please also advise on what type of USB you can use with a laptop instead of usernames and passwords, Kim? Okay, Kim, I think um, what you mean by that is a, a, the DOM I'm talking about, so the two-factor, multi-factor authentication. I hope I'm, I'm on the right track with this. So um, there's devices around, companies around that will sell a device, it's a USB device, that's an, that, that is an authentication device. So basically, um, to be able to get access to your computer, laptop, desktop, what have you, would require you to have you know, this USB device plugged in. There are also um, um, uh, uh, scanners and stuff as well, like the, the magnetic, like a credit card scanner, where you can use those. That They're a little bit outdated, I've got to say. Um, I know a company that I used to support um, in a previous life is called Vasco Data Security. Now, they're the world's innovators on on digital security and authentication. Um, there's uh, um, Soho products that you can download and use. Again, they're software-based and also hardware-based. But these the, the hardware-based versions, I believe, are always going to be more secure than software. The, the software is vulnerable. Um, the software can be compromised where when you're talking about a hardware device, it's a lot harder to compromise that device. It takes a lot more effort. Um, but again, just with that passwords, and I can't stress this enough, um, definitely use you know a combination of alphanumeric ca um, and characters, characters being you know your at symbol, hash, dollar sign percentage and use a mix of uppercase and lowercase. It makes no difference using uppercase, lowercase to a username, it's the password where, where it really makes a difference. Um, next question, privacy. I've had a client base that holds many clients' personal details. Do you have any comment to make regarding keeping this server data offshore or in Australia? Kerry. Okay, so Kerry, um, it's, that one's a little bit trickier to uh, decipher there because there's a there's a lot more things that come into it um, when you're talking about personal details. What sort of personal details is it? You know, what, how sensitive is the information is the information we're talking about? If it's basically like a contact database, um, look, sure, there's no problems with holding that offshore. First and foremost you've got to make sure you're using a reputable company. Um, if, you're, if you're using one of these small companies that are, that are out there that have set up, I probably wouldn't recommend that, but someone like Microsoft or Google or AWS or, or those sorts of guys that have got a very large footprint around the world, I definitely um, would have no problem in holding the data offshore at all. Well, guys, I've, uh, that's all the questions I've had to, for today. I'd like to Oh, sorry, Karen's just said we've got one more question. I 
Hi Scott, thanks for your insights. I've recently discovered that my Outlook file was being backed up by a Cronus due to a Windows registry setting designed to prevent this. Are there any other issues like this which I need to be aware of? Regards Richard. Uh, uh, so, okay, Richard's got two questions. Uh, the other question is also do you recommend using apps etc that record login details? I use one, it facilitates me using different login information, approximately 200 sites. Okay, great, great question. I'm going to go with the second question first, Richard, if I may, um, because those utilities, uh, I am a big believer of it. I don't believe in writing, you know, passwords down in a book because the book can be lost, that sort of thing. Um, there's applications out there, you know, online utilities. Um, I'm just trying to remember the one off the top of my head that's common. If I grab my phone quickly, I think I've got it installed. LastPass is, is one that our company operates and, and uses. The good thing about LastPass, Richard, too, uh, just from a business point of view, is that you can have a business account and in, then you can invite people into the LastPass and then you can share that information with your staff. But let's say your staff leave. You don't want them to have access to your passwords. So when a staff member leaves, when they resign or, or, or when they've been terminated, you can go in and remove them from your last pass. They'll never know the username or the password because it's an automatic login process. So you help, in, in that regard, you're helping keeping your data safe because you're not actually sharing the usernames and passwords with each of your staff members. You're sharing uh, a database which contains usernames and passwords that pro provides you automatic logon for each of those websites or services. So yes, I'm definitely a big believer in, in using um, password managers. Again, um, it's like anything in this world, safety first. Um, make sure you're using a reputable product, it's industry awarded, you know, you've got to tick the boxes basically. Um, the other question Richard had was about the Outlook file. Look, Acronis is a good product, Richard. Um, I'm not exactly sure of that particular issue that you've mentioned about out, um, Acronis locking Outlook. I, I find that a little bit strange, um, being that Acronis is, a, is, a, is a, a piece of backup software, if you like, and Outlook is your email application. Um, Acronis should be just imaging or, or, or at a very raw level, taking a copy of the files and folders that you've selected for backup. Um, so it, if worst comes to worst, it should only be locking a file during that backup process. After the backup is completed, the file should be unlocked and, and then ready for use. So there might be a, a small bug inside a Cronus which you've discovered and unfortunately encountered. But traditionally, uh, backup software, no. Your backup software should be able to, there's open file options and, and most backup software nowadays uh, will allow for open files and that sort of stuff. So basically, with the open file, it takes a copy of the file while it's open and it backs that up. It won't back up, obviously, any changes after that point. I hope I've answered that question uh, satisfactory enough for you, Richard. Uh, that concludes uh, any of the questions that we've got for today, so I'll hand back to Karen. Thanks very much, guys. It was a pleasure being able to uh, do this presentation for you. Thanks so much, Scott, and um, a, a very big thank you to everybody for joining us for our webinar presentation today. As always, um, CCIQ will follow up by sending out um, all of the slides and the audio for this particular event. Thank you very much.